pleasure to welcome you to Link Car Um As you may know, Link Car is co-advised by both me and Phil Muir. That's been a very successful arrangement for everybody. And um, and so, except for maybe a Link Car, he has two bosses, right? <laughs> So, and and, <laughs> um, and and even more people telling him what to do when we consider his service to our general objectives on the Selenium project. But anyway, Linker's been here since 2003, so not, you know, three 13. years. Huh? 13. So, I mean, 13. Right? <laughs> it's not been long. <laughs> he was probably born in 2003. But, um, so, yeah, three years. And, um, and so, uh, um, he came straight from Brazil where he got a Bachelor of Science in you know, Agronomy and Crop Science from the um, Federal University of Santa Maria. And um, over the course of his career since starting his undergraduate, he's worked with, of course, soybean, uh, potatoes, small grains, beet seeds, tomatoes, um, Maybe he's done a little bit for Bill with chickens. <laughs> and also um, published a paper and did some research as an undergrad on soil physics. So he's a, he has a good, well-rounded um, you know, agronomy background. Of course, he also um, grew up on a very large soybean farm in Brazil. And then since coming here, he's also delved into, of course, soybean breeding, uh, statistical genetics, bioinformatics, machine learning, and that kind of thing. Also, you know, agronomy and phenomics as well. So um, I just want you to be aware of the sort of breadth of what Elaine Carr has studied, and, and he's presenting what's in his dissertation, which is, um, you know, represents maybe half or less of what he's actually done in the past three years. So he has other publications that he's working on or has submitted or that have been published that are on things that he's not going to cover. And of course, we have lots of plans <laughs> and, and, and projects and progress that he's also working on. So um, other than that, I think um, I'll just turn it over then to Alinkar. Thank you again for coming. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Katie. So I'm going to get started right away. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to my defense. The title of my work is Plant Breeding Applications of Machine Learning. That's uh, basically what I've been developing the past three years. So here's a brief outline of my presentation. I'm going to start for, from the definition of what is machine learning and its rationale to uh, plant breeding genetics. It, of course, can be extended for uh, agronomic and uh, other studies. Then I'm going to introduce data set I've been collected and using for my analysis. Then two of my studies, um, one is how do soybean traits interact? And the second one is regarding uh, how, what are the factors that affect uh, genomic prediction. So very well, so what is machine learning? So machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence responsible for uh, pattern recognition where you want to optimize the problem solving. So the uh, major issues we use machine learning for is, to, is for prediction, classification, and sometimes uh, inference. And my favorite example of um, pattern recognition is the calculation of heritability using the animal model, because you express how the connection between the plants, and then you what you get out of it is the amount of variation that you observe in the phenotype due to uh, genetics, which uh, in, in statistics, it's also called interclass correlation coefficient. So why should you use uh, machine learning to uh, genetic studies, breeding? So basically, it's all about increased efficiency of your, your decision making. So we know that intelligent decision making, it's all about how well you can extract information from the data and properly use this information and how you, you know, define your, your losses and how you minimize your losses. Uh, so basically our goal is to achieve our go, uh, goal more efficiently. And machine learning experiments can be done in silicon, which means that they are free. And 
still you are increasing your efficiency, you can save a lot of money because you know how to better allocate your resources. And as we all know, uh, plant breeding is a game of numbers, so you actually really know where to uh, spend the least to make the most. So machine learning has uh, several classifications, but the two major ones are the so-called supervised and unsupervised machine learning. The supervised machine learning is when you have this predictor, things that are, um, are, are, are used to explain a response variable. So you have pre uh, predictors and a responsive variable of interest. In unsupervised learnings, you just have the check of data that you want to uh, get some interactions out of it because you don't have actually a response variable you just want to extract uh, information. So supervised learning is used for prediction and classification. For instance, yield models, or in this era of omics, you want to use this large amount of data to do predictions. And classification, um, for instance, market classes in, in wheat or maturity group in soybeans. Uh, another example in uh, environmental sciences, uh, when you want to do the soil classification, you just feed the parameters and you uh, classify the soil. And uh, applications of unsupervised are for clustering associations. For instance, in breeding, if you want to uh, detect which environments are similar or where plants behave similarly to cluster environments and define your targets, uh, you can also find uh, substructures in your population, things that are more related to each other, subpopulations or uh, Heterotic groups in corn, for instance. And other associations can do is trade off analysis because we know that when you increase one trait, the other one can decrease. And, uh, okay, let's move on. Now I'm going to introduce the data set I've used to perform uh, the, those studies. Uh, I've been working with the soy name population. Soy name that stands for soybean nested association mapping is the largest population for mapping purpose ever created. It has 5,600 lines which were grown unreplicated, uh, in, a, in a replicated trials, plus 800 checks that include parents and seven other lines that were grown unbalanced. Uh, so basically what an end population is, are, it's basically a composite population that includes 40 biparent populations. So you have one uh, parent, in this case it was Iowa 3023, and we cross to 40 parents that are called the founders. So they are all, all individuals in this population that are either full siblings or half siblings. Uh, we analyze, we collect data from many phenotypes, but in those, part, in those particular studies we used 40 major phenotypes that include yield components and some agronomic traits. The population was genotyped by a 6K SNP chip. The way how they designed this SNP chip was by uh, sequencing the parents, checking which markers, which loci were segregating, and then they collected 5,300 of those markers that were segregating the highest amount of families because you want to actually maximize the information you get out of it. After do some trimming and cleaning up, uh, I, I ended up uh, using just 40, 100 because some SNPs were, um, didn't provide a, a good information. The environments where I collect data was from 2012 to 2015. The full data was collected in 13 and 14, all the traits with no missing. In 2012, not all traits were collected. In 2015, not all, all uh, families were grown. We grew just six families in two environments, but in each environment we had uh, two replications. So that was the only year where we actually had uh, replicated trials. So for you guys to have an idea of how many data points we collected, those are um, the 14, 14 traits I analyzed. Yield, days to flowering, days to maturity, the length of reproductive period, which is uh, we obtain for the different uh, through the difference, plant height, lodging score, which is from a scale one to five, uh, average canopy closure, which is we, we take pictures weekly from the canopy and then we average them out. Rate of canopy closure, that means how fast the canopy uh, grows. Leaflet shape, node number and pod number in the main stem, 
pots, uh, pots per node that was obtained by uh, through the ratio, uh, seed weight, and internode length, which is basically high divided by a uh, number of nodes. In this graphic here, we see the number of observations, and in the main diagonal is for uh, each single trait, how many times we observe it. So it ranges from 10 to 19,000 observations. So it's a relatively large amount of data. To further characterize this population, I'm, I'm going to show two graphics. This one is the linkage disequilibrium. So soybeans, has, uh, soybeans have 20 chromosomes. Um, here represented by uh, eta square matrix and the main diagonal it really shifted itself. So what this uh, linkage equilibrium graphic shows is, it, let, let, we can think of it as a um, degree of multicollinearity, meaning that many SNPs tell the same story because they are so close and there is no recombination between, between them that pretty much they have very similar information. Uh, for instance, chromosomes 8 and 18, we have this uh, large blocks that can be also just a cluster of SNPs that are very close to each other. The second uh, graphic I would like to show is the genomic relationship matrix. That's a matrix with uh, 5,500 lines and columns. Uh, I, I, I'm stating the number of the families uh, on the y and x axis. And one, uh, as you can see the, in the main diagonal, they are a little clear because the families are more similar, with, like, plants are more similar within family than across family. But again, they are all uh, poor half seeds. We don't see clear clusters uh, because it, it might be a function of ascertainment bias because we pick these SNPs that would maximize information. So we may uh, lose this piece of information of how distinct subpopulations would be. But we know that the soy and population would have three uh, sources, uh, the elite germplasm from the United States, plant introductions, and some plants with uh, diverse background. So now I'm going to start uh, talking about my uh, first study, is how do uh, soybean traits interact? So there are some key questions that come out of when someone is studying uh, interactions, which is, what does control yield, which is the driven trait of soybeans or, or pretty much all the crops, and how do the traits interact, how they connect to yield, and is that, is that a relationship due to genetics or to environment, or, or both? And the connections among traits, do they occur, um, what the, the observed connections are through genetics or environment? So when you do a straight correlation, that's a... Um, correlation table of my 14 traits, where the upper diagonal is the Pearson correlation, which is a measure of linear association, and the lower diagonal is the rank order correlation or Spearman correlation that's nonlinear. We see that everything looks uh, significantly associated. But would soybeans be such a complex organism that everything is really connected? So I'm going to introduce now the idea of conditional independence. So uh, suppose that a study was conducted in, in a school uh, and they found that shoe size was linearly associated to the IQ of the students. So they introduced another uh, characteristic, another trait, and they saw that both shoe size and IQ were associated to age, but how could that be? So it turns out that uh, students that are older, they are more likely to get better IQ scores, and also because they are older, they have a larger shoe size. So it turns out that IQ and shoe size are conditionally independent, but uh, they are uh, explained by age in this example. So Y and uh, X would be conditionally independent. That's the whole idea of uh, a statistical procedure known as uh, Markov random fields or graphical models. And what, what do we want to do? is a similar procedure, but with soybeans. For instance, in A here, we see that all traits are connected, and it's not a very informative model. And what you want is to drive into a model where you know that just some traits are connected, and the white arrows in B represent conditionally independent traits. And so basically, that's the phenomenon. We know that phenotype, it can be explained by genetics, environment, and higher order interaction. 
with regard to environmental have controllable with stochastic, controllable would be management practice because we actually can control that. And the genetics would be additive, which are the interest for breeders because it's transmissible for the next generation and non additive that's not of interest. So to do this splitting between phenotypic into genetic and environmental, we use a, uh, the, as a learning algorithm, the multivariate mixed model. So we use a kernel that defines the relationship among individuals, and then we can say this much was genetics and this much was environment. So what we get out of it is a similar correlation table, but instead of phenotypic correlations here, we have on the upper diagonal in blue, genetics, and in green, we have environmental correlations. So here, we are no longer talking about phenotypes. We're talking about genetic and environment. And in the main diagonal, in yellow, we have the heritabilities. OK, so that's the output. Uh, those are called the graphical models from our uh, Markov random fields. And from here, we can start noticing some patterns. That, for instance, uh, the youth compensation ability of soybeans, that is a very uh, well-known phenomenon, was observed in the experiment in environmental correlation. So what, uh, what it sees, for instance, a stress occurs in the plant in a given moment. It's, of course, it's, a, it's, it's from a environmental stimuli. So it's associated more to environment than to genetics. The connection between yield and canopy closure was observed in both genetic level and environmental level. For instance, we know that uh, many management practices like density and row spacing are used to manage the uh, canopy closure. So of course, when a, a trait is observed in both genetics and environmental level associated to another trait, they will, they will, be, they will appear also uh, phenotypically associated. Another interesting one is maturity and yield, which here we see uh, linearly associated because it pops up in a Pearson correlation and also in the uh, environmental correlation. Another thing interesting you can get out of those uh, graphical models is if, if I'm a breeder and I want to exploit things from the genetic standpoint, I would get things that are connected directly to yield. In this case, would be reproductive, uh, the length of reproductive pair, no number, and uh, average kind of closure. What data set is this on? Is the synonym that I... Uh, okay. The well, the whole, just one year or the whole thing? or Five years. So it's, it's an for average. For years and, and the last okay. one was... Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not over. Okay. Yeah. It was over years. Okay. Yeah. And likewise, in, if you check in the environmental trends, you can see what's connected to you to perhaps further exploit from the agronomic standpoint. Another analysis of pattern recognition that we, we, we are familiar with and it's kind of interesting is the principal components. Principal components that are the eigenvectors of a correlation matrix. They provide a good idea of trade-off. They do not inform you about um, conditional independence. We can think of it as a, another way to tell the same story. We observe this, uh, similar patterns, like what was connected to it before is going to also pop up here. But it also gives an idea of uh, magnitude, because the length of the uh, arrows also uh, indicates the strength of the connection among traits. So very well, now I'm going to start uh, my second study, which is a supervised machine learning, where I'm, I actually have response variables. So because I'm studying prediction, so I use my genetics to predict my phenotypes. So basically, uh, the questions that uh, we want to answer here is like how to best allocate resources when you have your breeding program and you want to do genomic prediction. How to play with the assumptions and learn, about, uh, learn with the data. And would I expect to have better genotypes or better phenotypes? I mean, more market and how to deal with the training set, and do different traits should be treated, treated differently. So, oh, let me just show you another thing. So the way how we do it is through cross-validation. So we have the whole data set. What we do is we omit part of the phenotypes, we calibrate our model with a part of our, our data, and test in the other part of the data. And then we see how well we did with this cross-validation. Uh, the four factors I study here were training population sizes. 
how I can predict my phenotypes using 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 um, individuals. Phenotypic adjustment, is that worth it? In this case, we are uh, driving to the conclusion that is it worth to increase the quality of our phenotypes? And then I test no adjustment in two methods of Krigi. Phenotypic uh, genotypic density. So here I'm testing with a thousand markers, two and four. And also the prediction model where, where uh, from the machine learning, for some reason, is the, the favorite topic where you just try several assumptions. Where I tested additive and kernel based methods. Very well, phenotypic adjustment. How can I adjust my phenotypes and, uh, considering that I don't even have reps? So we use a strategy called Krigging. For instance, if you have several plots in your field that are in a wet spot, sometimes your blocking system is not capable of detecting that because the block is relatively large, but just a part of your block has this pr uh, trouble. So here, that how we illustrate that. We have our plot in the field and we want to tell the model the relationship in the field where these plots are. In this case, for instance, uh, in the red uh, circle, I, I made the representation of a exponential kernel on the right. And as you can see, the side neighbor plots are much closer because the plots are not square. They are actually rectangular. So the side-by-side -side plots would be more correlated. Basically, it's, it's based on a uh, Euclidean distance in the field uh, among plots. And that's how uh, I made the correction. So I fitted a model that has the environmental specification where the plots are in the field, plus a genetic term. And we hypothesized that the way how you express the genetics will change how the model identifies what is genetics and what is field. So you get a, a better representation. So we, we tested no adjustment, a linear kernel the, uh, that assumes that the lines are just connected in additive fashion uh, through genetics, or Gaussian kernels where it's not necessarily linear. And what we got out of it is that no adjustment always provided a lower heritability because, of course, we are not we are not removing this uh, field variation from our data. The Gaussian kernels usually provided the best, except for uh, height that uh, we had some overfitting. And in this case, the linear kernel performed best. The second uh, effect that we tested was trading population size. Of course, more data you use, better the prediction will be. That there's no, no much question about it. But it's interesting to see that you just have a, an actual improvement up to like roughly 2,000. From that point, you'd have to grow extra 1,000 plots to get a marginal gain in prediction. So if I want to save money, I probably will not grow more than 2,000 uh, soybean plots for a population with a, a structure similar to cyanide. The third factor was the number of SNPs. Here, just to illustrate uh, the comparison, the straight comparison, one in 4,000 markers, where, yeah, of course, 4,000 markers will give you a better prediction, but turns out that this pre uh, increase in predict Predictive ability was just by 0 0.000. It's like it's like marginal. You have four times more markers, pardon me, three times more markers, but really you're not adding anything to your uh, model. Just cost. And the prediction model. So the prediction model is funny because here you start playing with assumptions in whichever model have the closest assumptions close pardon, the assumptions closer to the reality you're going to get better predictions so things that you have to consider is uh, regularization because you can just put all your markers uh, make a, this very complex model it, it's going to be beautiful it's going to say uh, it explains r, r square one explains everything but with horrible prediction properties uh, variable selection is like, do you really believe that every single SNP you're adding has an effect to your trait? Or you can set some uh, markers of zero effect. And non-additivity is when you use kernel methods, is like the relationship among individuals, is it linear or non-linear? Here's uh, 
a better illustration of how to play with these assumptions. So those are three major uh, genome prediction models. They are called BLUP, Base A, and Base in Lasso. They have the normal distribution, P and Laplace, respectively. As you can see, if you fit a model with BLUPs, what's the probability of you getting a uh, marker effect, a KTL, that has an effect three or larger? It's, it's like nearly zero. Whereas in T and double exponential methods, you see this thick tails. So you're allowing your model to have large effect QTLs for both sides. With regard to parsimony, we know that these models have variations that uh, accommodate zero effect markers. Those would be called the base B, which is the base A, but allowing for variable selection. And base C, that's the blood version that allows for variable selection. Uh, other two possible models, as I said, the kernel methods. The GBLUP, which is linear, it considers that the association among individuals is linear. It does not assign value to markers. It just tells the relationship and maps. Uh, it's a mapping-based prediction. So this table uh, is the posterior probability of each model to give you the best, the most accurate prediction. I did it uh, for in, in this table for each of the training population size. What you can see, for instance, is that a model like Base B uh, performs very well when you have 250 individuals, but as you increase the number of uh, observations, the probability of Base B alone being the best model reduces. So the same model is not necessarily the best for our training population size or perhaps for all traits. And what you notice that our, our model choice in this study was the combination of T models, which are base B in base A, uh, associated to reproducing kernel Hubert space, which are the Gaussian kernels, meaning that it assumes that lines can be connected in nonlinear fashion. And that makes sense to me because if you think of the model base B, it's a T tail distribution, meaning it's a T distributed markers, meaning that you can have large effect QTLs, but it can also have new effect QTLs. And, uh, since it's associated to the Gaussian kernel, lines can be non-linearly associated. So what, in, basically what you're doing is a assumption relaxation. You really are letting the data speak by itself and learning the most out of it. So a summary of my study too is that how, how we would apply and how, what are the fact, how much the factors uh, can increase predictive ability. So of course, training population size is the largest one. Uh, however, that's the one that costs a lot of money because you are uh, increasing the number of observations. The phenotypic adjustment increases up to 18% of your uh, predictive ability, but it's free. It's just a statistical procedure. It's how well you block your field. It's how well you collect your phenotypes uh, or the technology used to collect your phenotypes. And then the prediction model uh, it's just to uh, increase 2%, but why not? Since it's free, you might as well just test the model. And this difference can increase when you don't have a, uh, a lot of data. And the genotyping density, moving from 1 to K, uh, to 4K markers, uh, it was minimal. So you can increase your, uh, in this case, we could increase our predictive ability just by 0.63% by increasing from 1,000 to 4,000 markers. So I'd like to acknowledge Kate and Bill for mentoring and the opportunity and for a lot of patients that they really require a lot of patients to be my advisors. Uh, ben, Curtis and Chris because, uh, for the friendship and also for helping me collecting the data and extensive discussions we had uh, about how to do everything and how things interact. Uh, Professor Shizong Su from Riverside who really provided me a, a lot with regard to the theoretical background. DAO, because they founded me since my second semester, and they paid the data collection, the experiments. USB paid the sign in from 11 to 13. Bill Beavis from Iowa, he uh, checked all my articles. And Brian, Jim, and Randy from uh, Illinois, they uh, developed the experiment, and they also provided the germplast. And Perry and Kijan, they performed the genotyping. They did a pretty good job. 
with uh, just typing in now. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm open for uh, questions.